outside of, of course, you know, different programs that we have in the community and so on, like our after school program and such. But we want to be able to show in a little way um, how much we appreciate each and every one of you. So if you did not receive a gift, um, I'm sorry, I think they ran out of the little bags, but I think the gift is still there, Sister Zen, right? So we should be able to have enough for everyone. So I'm going to ask the deacons if they would at the end of the service today, if they would be at both doors um, to be able to give out uh, those gifts to those who did not receive it. Is that okay, church? Yes. All right, wonderful, wonderful. Now, um, today, as you know, it sparks the, it's the beginning of the new year. Um, I'm starting a new trend in that I don't intend to preach very long, but just get to the point. Is that okay? Yes. Oh, you guys didn't even say amen. You want me to preach long. Okay, <laughs> that's fine. I can do that too. I can do that too. Um, but today the message is entitled Waiting in Anticipation and uh, the reason for that is of course to kick off our week of prayer because as a church we have to start the year in prayer. And so this afternoon um, at 6 p.m. I'm asking if each and every one of you um, can return here where we continue to pray um, and seek God uh, for this new year because there are some things that, that we don't know what struggles we're going to have to face this year. But uh, we're going to have to put some things in prayer. Some things we're going to have to fast about. And uh, last year, very early in the year, I went on a 30-day fast. Uh, and many of you had joined me uh, for that 30-day fast. And I'm about to do the same uh, once again. I know that we're only going to be fasting or praying for about a week uh, for the week of prayer. So every night this week at 7.15 p.m. or 7 o'clock p.m. every night this week, we're going to be here in prayer. But... Uh, but throughout this entire month, we're going to be in, uh, in fasting. And many of you can fast in different ways. You can fast away from food. You can fast away from media, which is a huge fast. You know? So even if you're working and your work is in media, you can say, you know what, I'm only dedicating my time at work for media. But outside of that, you tell all the people, they can write you a letter because you're not going to be able to, to speak to them on, via by social media or whatnot. And that is a tough one. That's a tough one for me. I've yet to try that one. But uh, that's another type of fast that we can do. And, um, and we can have a nut or fruit fast. So you're not going hungry for a month or so on, but you're actually staying away from the regular meals and just eating fruits. And be sure your health will tell you that it's thankful um, for some of us who have not been taking care of our bodies like we should. Um, especially this, this Christmas, this uh, New Year time period that many of us were there gathering with different people, we placed some things in our body that we know was not very good. Tell the truth, shame the devil, folks. Um, but we can, we can make things right and uh, go on a fast together. Now, on that note, waiting in anticipation, our scripture reading was taken from Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24, verses 1 to 14. I'm not going to read everything there. But I'm going to focus now, I'm going to focus now on verses 11 to 14. It says, Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations. And then the end will do what? The end will come. Let us pray together. Father in heaven, Lord, we ask today that you will speak to each and every one of us, O oh God. That we'll be reminded today that your coming is very soon. We'll get our act together. And Lord, we ask, that, we ask today, O oh God, that you will use uh, me once again to speak your word, O oh God. Lord, even if they don't remember my name, at least they'll remember that you are Jesus and you are coming again. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Matthew chapter 24, a very well-known passage of scripture, which many people, many people around the world uh, know very well because of the importance of it about the second coming and telling us exactly what is to come, what is happening right now and what has taken place in the past. Now, just a little background on this, if I would just give you a little background before we get into the text. Is that okay? Yeah. All right, so when the Jews returned from Babylonian captivity, they, they rebuilt the temple. And 500 years later, it was reconstructed under Herod, and this was the temple that was in Christ's day. Now, 
The beautiful thing about this temple is that it was rebuilt with the splendor and grandeur similar to the former one, Solomon's temple, but it was not the same and it was a little inferior to that one, but, but it was well known and it was well constructed. But Jesus predicted in this same text in Matthew 24 that that temple, Herod's temple, will be destroyed. And the disciples now didn't understand, so they came to Jesus and they said to him, Master, what in the world are you talking about? Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of your coming? Now stay with me now, we're talking about the second coming, waiting in anticipation. Now you can imagine the animosity and the hostility that stirred up among Christ's enemies in hearing, hearing him say that their beloved temple will be destroyed. And the disciples now is pushing this and asking him, they want to know what are going to be some of the signs that will tell us of your coming that you're talking about. But they really believed that the master was going to come and he was going to establish his kingdom in that time period. They didn't understand or even comprehend the fact that it will be years or even thousands of years after Jesus that will still be on this earth. They didn't think about that. And they expected that it was going to be immediate, but we are still here. And many of you have heard many preachers talk about the second coming of Jesus. Uh, have you not? You've heard it from years now, talking about Jesus is coming soon, he's coming soon, he's coming soon, but he's not here yet. And then many people get, get offended. They say, well, well, that means then that Jesus Christ has lied because he's not coming back. I haven't seen him yet. How does somebody, somebody know if Jesus Christ is coming? How can you be sure? Has he really lied? Is he, is he one that will lie to each and every one of us that he's coming back? Am I just standing here telling you fables? Now, here's one reason. There's one reason that you can know. Seldom, someone said, will any man die for a lie. And the disciples, each and every one of them, when Jesus said to them, you are going to die, they didn't believe that they were going to be going to, to their own death. But each and every one of them had a chance to say, you know what, forget it. I'm not going to go to this thing. Peter was crucified upside down. Because he said, he's not even worthy to cruci be crucified the same way as his Lord. So he said, crucify me upside down. Seldom would anybody die for a lie. Why in the world will all of the disciples go to their death believing something if it was not true? So here we are, now 2,000 plus years later, still claiming that Jesus Christ is coming again. And how in the world should somebody like you and I be sure when we're reading the Bible, how can we be sure that, that Jesus Christ is really going to return? Well, let me share with you what Matthew 24 says. Matthew 24 is a beautiful passage of scripture because here we find where it encapsulates everything that Jesus Christ said is going to happen in the last days that should let us know that his coming back is very soon. Now here's what he said, Jesus answered and said unto them, because they were asking, how should we know? What is the manner of your coming and the end of this world? Jesus said in verse 4, take heed that no one does what? Oh, you guys are with me today. No one deceives you. I wondered why in the world would Jesus put this thing first? That nobody deceives you. Now, now I'm going off my notes. I forgot my notes a long time ago. Let me tell you, the reason why he says, don't let anybody deceive you, and he mentions this thing first, is because he knows many of us are gonna be plagued in the last days with all types of nonsense coming at us, claiming, people are claiming to be Jesus. Did you know that? Yes. And they come and they say all manner of stuff, and some of them dabble in even hypnosis. They're hypnotizing people. I saw on, 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 on YouTube this past, they're actually making people go out there and eat grass because he's able to hypnotize them. And they're there and they're e eating grass and he tells them, come on back inside this church now. And all of them start running back inside because they have been deceived. And the devil knows fully well that in these last days, many people will be deceived. Guess what? Coming to church is not gonna save you. So you all can sit here and throw our hands and, and sing all we want. But if we're not living a godly life, if our life is not a testament to what Christ says in the word of God, then we're all fooling ourselves. Jesus says this, for many will come in my name saying, I am Christ 
and will deceive many. That's the first thing. Now, if you look back in history, you hear of names like David Koresh, who had a, a compound of people way down in, in Waco, Texas. We hear of Jim Jones. You guys ever hear that name? We hear of people like that who deceived people, who all committed mass suicides because they believed that they were Christ on earth. Listen, folks, no matter where you are right now, and if, if someone comes and they claim to be Jesus Christ on earth, you could tell them to their face they're a liar. How do we know? Because Christ says when he comes back, every eye shall see him. Rome, Revelation chapter 1 and verse 7, Behold, he comes in the clouds, and every eye shall see him, even those who pierced him. So if someone is on earth and they're claiming to be Christ, I can definitely tell you, based on the word of God, that they're a liar. Yes. Now, is Christ a liar when he says that he's coming back? Because then he says, he says in his word, when you look back, when you look back, you find all types of things. But in, in John, John chapter 14, John chapter 14 and verses 1 to 3 he says, Let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are what? Amen. Many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will do what? Come again. Come again. Jesus Christ declares himself that he's going to come again. Now, is he a liar? Is he a liar? And how can somebody tell that Jesus Christ is going to come again? Right now, when you look around the world, people are scared when, I, when they talk about the second coming of Christ. Some people are trying to get themselves prepared. Maybe you know of people right now who are storing up weapons because they're scared about this battle that's to come. There are people who are storing up food. Sister Cole, maybe you know some people who are storing up food. Some people are storing up food because they know that there is coming a time when there's not going to be enough food for everybody. Come on, folks. Some people are storing up gold and silver because they think there is going to be a cashless society. So if I store up gold and silver, then I'll have when no one else has. And what they fail to realize is that all of these things, God has already promised that they're going to be taken away. When you look at the scripture in Matthew 24, it says, For many will come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled. See that you are not troubled. Now that comes for each and every one of us, because we fail to realize that God has promised that we will never go hungry. He has promised that he will always be there with us and for us. In Isaiah 33, Isaiah 33 and verses 16, he says that our bread and our water shall be sure. So even if the time comes where we don't have enough food on the table, God says, I will still provide for you and I, won't, I will always provide your bread and your water. You don't have to worry about tomorrow. I looked, up, I looked up Sister White and I had, to, I had to read this passage here from Early Writings, page 56. She says, the Lord has shown me repeatedly that it is contrary to the Bible to make provisions for our temporal wants in the time of trouble. I saw that if the saints had food laid up for them or in the field in the time of trouble, when sword and famine and pestilence are in the land, it will be taken from them by violent hands and strangers would reap their fields. Then will be the time for us to trust wholly in God and he will sustain us. I saw that our bread and water will be sure at that time and that we shall not lack or suffer hunger for God is able to spread a table for us in the wilderness. If necessary, he would send ravens to feed us as he did for Elijah or rain manna from heaven as he did for the Israelites. Amen. We don't have to worry about tomorrow. There are people who are digging holes right now claiming that they can live underground. You don't understand that even if you live on the ground, God knows you're there. Yes. And when this world starts crumbling, those, those caves are going to crumble. And if you're inside of it, you're going to crumble in it. Because you're not trusting God enough to take care of you in these last days. One of the first things, first warnings Christ said is that be sure. Don't let anybody deceive you. The message of the coming of Jesus is one of hope, but yet one that should cause us to be patient. It is one of watchfulness. In fact, in fact, Matthew 24 
and verses 24 gives us a sobering message there. If you would look at it with me, because it still talks about the people who are trying to deceive you. It says in verse 24, for false Christ and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, whom? The very elect, people who think that they're closest to God will be deceived in the last days. Not realizing that the enemy is so deceptive that he will use whatever methods available to try and deceive us. So we have to be watchful. I found another text, 1 Peter 5 and verse 8. 1 Peter 5 and verse 8. 1 Peter 5 and verse 8. Is our technology people back there? 1 Peter 5 and verse 8. All right. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a what? Roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. We find this, we find this, 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 this time period right now where many people are being deceived. And the devil continues to walk about like a roaring lion seeking to confuse and devour people, to lead people astray. But we're called to be watchful, to be people who will continue to study the word. And if you study the word, you will know definitely that if somebody comes and claims to be Christ, they cannot be because the word of God points us to the, the events leading up to the coming of Jesus Christ. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verses 3, it warns us. I'm giving you all the warnings now. It warns us because it says, first off, that in the last days many people will want peace. And right now when you listen on the television, when you listen on your radios, you hear of people talking about peace. There's always peace treaties being signed and before long they have to go back and sign them again. Because they claim to want peace, but then there is no peace. And sorry to, 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 to get under your skin right now, but the truth is that there is, this is a message kind of gloom and doom because it's not going to get better in the future. Amen. I'm sorry to let you know, but it's not going to get better. The stuff that we're witnessing right now is only going to get worse. For the Bible says, for when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman and they shall not escape. So in these last days, when everybody is claiming to have peace and wanting peace and we need to live in peace, all of a sudden there is destruction, the Bible says. Then we go on. So then I come back to the original question. What will then be the manner of Christ coming? Is it just a made up fallacy? Or how can I be sure? How can you be sure? In Acts chapter one, at verses nine to 11, the Bible says this. The Bible says this. Acts chapter one, Acts chapter one, verses nine to 11, verses nine to 11. If you go back to verse 9 for me, please. The Bible says, Now when he had spoken these things while they watched, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly, steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up for you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. Now my friends, I want you to focus on this text. Why? Because here you find the disciples looking at Jesus. They're seeing him literally going into heaven. And now the Bible says that the same Jesus, the same way that Christ went into heaven, where they were able to see him, is the same way that he's going to return and people will see him. So if someone claims to be Christ on this earth, you know that they're lying. But the truth is that when Christ comes, every eye will see him. And the Bible tells us that in the same way, the literal way that they saw Christ going into heaven is the same way they're going to be able to see him coming again. Now the Bible also declares in Matthew 24 and verses 36 that no one knows the day nor the hour that Jesus Christ is going to come. So if somebody claims and says, I know that he's coming in 2016, December the 16th, I can say definitively that they're a liar. Why? Because the Bible says that no one knows the day nor the hour. So no one can tell you exactly when Jesus Christ is going to come. But here's the thing. 
Based on the signs that are written in Matthew 24, we can tell that it's getting close. How do we know? Luke chapter 21, Luke chapter 21 and verse 11. I'm going to go to that. Luke chapter 21 and verse 11. Luke 21 and verse 11. It says this, And there will be great earthquakes in various places, and famines and pestilences, and there will be fearful sights and great signs from heaven. My friends, these are just some of the signs that you will see before Christ comes. And here is the question I have for you. Are you seeing these signs today? Yes. Have you been seeing these signs more and more as we go? Yes. Now you can go back and do your own research, but you'll find that in the past couple of years, there have been more and more earthquakes than ever before. There have been more and more famines than ever before. Some countries don't have famines. They've been lasting years upon years into this time. We are so blessed that we go home and we have an abundance of food and we say, thank you, God. Some of us don't even say, thank you, God. Because we have been so blessed that we've become almost, almost, uh, 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 almost clueless to the other issues that are happening around us. We sometimes sit here and we hear that 40,000 people lost their lives. There's a mudslide in this country and 100,000 people died. And we don't even blink an eye. We don't even stop for a moment to even consider 40,000 people. What does 40,000 people look like? What does 120,000 people look like that just dies in a mudslide? And we don't even think for a moment or a tsunami or a hurricane or something happens, some catastrophe, and we don't even stop to say, my Lord, something is going on. Because the truth is that we have been asleep for a long time. And we don't even keep, keep in mind that Jesus said, these are some of the signs that should let you know that my coming is very soon, like a woman who has labor pains. And as a woman who has labor pains, the pains intensifies as the baby is about to be born in the same way that before Jesus Christ comes in the clouds of glory, there are these things that will happen more and more. The frequency of these things will happen to the extent that we got to say, man, something is up. I don't even know about you, but don't you think it is strange that in December we had hot weather? And we don't even stop to even think for a moment that something is up here. Something is fishy that we have got to stop for a moment and say, hey, we're living in Canada, but we're warm. The weather has gone mad, and these are all signs that Jesus Christ is about to come. And I'm here to remind you to get your act together because he is coming. Because he said it. In fact, the Bible reminds us that God cannot lie. So if he said that he's coming, he is going to come. Now there are other things that we should mention. I'm going to ask if we can turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy th chapter 3 and verses 1 to 3. Let us read that pa passage right there. 2 Timothy chapter 3. Delano, if you're with me. 2 Timothy chapter 3. The Bible says, You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and the things that you have heard from me among well, thank you. But know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. Next, next potion. Lana was back there. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, and the list goes on and on. Let me just stop here for a moment. Hold on there, Delano. Just hold it right there. Have you been able to see all of these things? Yes. I mean, the Bible is explicit when it comes to the second coming of Jesus. Men will be lovers of themselves. My friends, if you look around right now, people are harboring thousands and millions of dollars to themselves, and they will not share it to ensure that, that someone is taking care of who is in need. They love themselves. They care about only themselves. There are people who walk around with a proud chest because they're big boasters. I've got this and you don't have it. They're proud. There are people who are blasphemers. They say, you know what? Hey, there is no God. 
Some people are walking around and they, they're disrespectful to their parents. Before we were a part of a society where people actually cared for their parents as they got older. Now there are people who grow their children up, they put money aside, they send them to school, they get an education, and the children come out and say, forget you, dad. Forget you, mom. Because they're unthankful. They're disobedient. They will curse you out in a second. They won't even, they won't even, can I, can I, can I get in your face? Yes. I mean, you guys are getting kind of quiet on me. There are people who will curse you out in a minute. Young people who will disrespect their parents to their face. And the Bible declares that all of these things, when you begin to see it, these are all signs of the very end. Yes. And we need to recognize them for what it is. Go to the next text, Delano. It says, people without natural affection. I mean, he, he's, 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 it's taking a while. Without natural affection, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control. Some people say, I can't control myself, Pastor. I try to do good, but I can't control myself. And that's all the signs that we're seeing, brutal. I mean, to, for the Bible to have that in there, I said, man, what, what in the world does that mean? Really, it means like you, you don't even have a heart. And when you look online, you see some people who, who some young people who are actually involved in, in this new game where they go ahead and they punch people in the back of the head when they're not looking. Have you seen that? Luke, you think it's funny, right? Because, because people do that all the time. It's just absolutely brutal. I mean, it's just insensitive. It's uncaring. I mean, and it goes on. Despises of good. Some people, you do good, you do good for others, and they turn around and they hate you. And these are all signs of the last days. Now go on, James chapter 5 and verses 1 to 7. I'm going to end soon. James chapter 5 and verses 1 to 7. The Bible says, come now, you rich, weep and howl of your miseries that are coming upon you. you your riches are corrupt and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver are corroded and their corrosion will be a witness against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have heaped up treasure in the last days. Indeed, the wages of the laborers who mowed your field, which you kept back by fraud, cry out and the, sit and the cries of the reapers have reached the ears of the Lord of the Sabaoth. These are all signs of the last days that people will defraud others. They will take from others. They will hoard to themselves their riches without sharing. And God says they are corrupt. They have garments, but they don't realize those garments are going to be nothing in the end. They have gold and silver, but it will all be rusty because God has the, the most precious gold in his kingdom. So all of these things must come to pass. Since the turn of the century, we have seen even mounting tension between capital and labor. Almost daily we have accounts of people who are on strike because they're not getting paid enough. And people are still hoarding their millions while others are starving to death. But the question still remains, can we be sure that Jesus Christ is going to come. Second Peter chapter three and verses eight and nine as I wind down. Second Peter th chapter three verses eight and nine says, but beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with God one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise as some count slackness, but is long suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And we ask the question, how in the world can we continue to live in a place that's so messed up? And that the Bible lets us know that the only reason why is because we think that time is so short and God is delaying this thing because he doesn't want anyone to be lost. So he keeps pushing it back a little bit more, hoping that somebody else is going to give their life to him, hoping that somebody is going to come and, and accept him as Lord and Savior. But the time will come where God is going to say enough is enough. Yes. Paul, in fact, in Titus chapter 2 and verse 13, calls the second coming of Jesus the blessed hope. Matthew 24 and verses 42 reminds us that we must keep watch and keep alert because Jesus Christ is going to come. 
in Acts, or sorry, in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verses 10, the Bible lets us know, 2 Peter chapter 3 and verses 10, the Bible tells us that Jesus Christ is going to come as a thief. And some people say, well, what in the world does that mean? When he says that he comes as a thief, some people actually took that to mean that Jesus Christ is going to come back and many people are not going to know. So you had the whole Left Behind series that came about because of that. Many of you know what I'm talking about, right? The whole Left Behind series says that Christ, when he comes, is going to come like a thief in the night. So when he comes, he snatches some people. So imagine a plane is actually flying and in midair the pilot has been good and all of a sudden the plane is going down because the pilot just vanishes. Because Christ came and took him like a thief. But the Bible says that every eye shall see him. So we know that it's not so. So what does it mean that he's coming like a thief? He's coming like a thief because a thief does not announce his appearing. Doesn't announce it. I tell you, I don't know if I ever told you the story, but we, we, were, we, were, uh, we, we bought a home and then, then we, we, we went out, we went out shopping one day, came home and realized that someone was, was trying to get into our house. Anyone had that experience? And they, the only thing that saved us was a little, little uh, latch that we had on the sliding door because they tried to pry the whole thing open. And I remembered this text because Jesus Christ is going to come as a thief. When the thief comes, he doesn't announce it. He doesn't tell you, I'm, look here, I'm going to come at your house at 6 p.m. No thief tells you that. The thief tries to sneak in when you least expect it. He's going to come in. Not that he's trying to find you unaware. Christ is coming to do that. But the thief tries to find you unaware. But Christ doesn't. Christ prepares you for the moment that he's coming. He gives you signs, which is strange that he calls himself a thief when yet he's still coming and he's giving you signs to tell you, no, I'm coming at 6 p.m. And yet we're still not getting ourselves ready because we think we have all the time in the world. It's going to be a surprise for people who are not ready. So here we're told that we should be ready. We should get our lives ready. In fact, when he comes, we know that it's not going to come like a thief because 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verses 16 says that he comes with a shout. Right? And the trumpet of God. So we know that when he comes, not only is it going to be literal, it's going to be visible, but he's coming and it's going to be loud. So every eye is going to see him and we're going to hear him. Now as I come down to a close, 1 Peter chapter 4 and verses 7. 1 Peter chapter 4 and verses 7. Chapter 4 and verses 7 says this. But in the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers. In fact, some of your Bibles say, be sober, be vigilant, be diligent. My friends, that's what we're called to do. And I know I went through all of these different texts and maybe I lost some of you. But the, the gist of this message is simply to let you know that we don't have much time on this earth. And many of us have been playing around, acting like, you know what, uh, no one really knows what I'm struggling with. No one knows my sin, my hidden stuff. And maybe we don't. But God does. And God wants for each and every one of us to be saved. And many of us are going through life as if Christ, well, he might show up. He may or may not come. And the Bible says, no, he will come and he will not tarry. But he's waiting for us to get our lives right. That's the main reason. When I think back at all the people in this world who had money, and yet are still unhappy. It tells me that there's got to be something better than this. When I think back at how many people in this world have suffered and died, I've got to say, it's got to be better than this. With the amount of people that have gone to graves, the amount of funerals that have had to stand over, funerals of little babies I say they've got to be something better than this and all that we have to do is accept Jesus Christ as our Savior and see 
that there is a chance that we will be there he's not gonna tarry he will come and we have got to make up our mind that we are going to be there I end with the story of Howard Hughes who was known as a billionaire the man was a very tall big strong man and when they found him he was in his home seated on a chair and they didn't know how long he was there because they had to use his fingerprints to identify him his nails had grown his hair was long and he was there with needles in his arm a billionaire because he didn't know God and I've got to think back at all of these guys who have done all of these things you can go back to history money is not all fame it vanishes beauty it fades the only thing that's a surety is your decision that you will accept Jesus Christ who is coming again many people think that Christianity is just a washed up thing oh I don't have to be a Christian oh I don't have to believe I don't even have to believe in this Bible thing guess what in spite of whether you believe or not Jesus Christ is still going to come and when he comes is either he finds you ready or he finds you not ready and for us I don't know about you but at least it's worth a chance at least it's worth a chance that what if it is true and you didn't get your life together then what will happen to you God is still so merciful that right now he extends that hand of mercy and he says if you would just accept me if you would still accept me as Lord and Savior I will do whatever it takes to save you today I'm gonna to ask for those who want to make a decision today you want to say Lord in this 2016 I'm going to be able to stand for you if that is your your earnest desire you're gonna stand for him whatever that means for you that's that, that's okay but you're gonna stand just stand with me just stand with me you're gonna stand for him in 2016 I know the hour is getting late for others who are here you've been going your own way doing your own thing maybe you've even strayed away from God for a time maybe you just started to believe you just have a little bit of belief and you want to say pastor I want you to pray for me I want to be able to give my life to him I'm struggling I'm still struggling but I want to be able to to give my life to him one day if that is your desire can you just raise your hand you want to give your life to Jesus Christ I see your hands I see your hands I see your hands God bless you I see your hands I see your hands I see your hands I'm gonna pray for you father in heaven Lord I just want to thank you today we know that you're coming back soon oh God and we're waiting right now oh God anticipating that moment we don't want to be one of those who are like a skeptic thinking that there is no way you're coming back we have seen all of the signs oh God and we know more and more each day that all these signs point to the fact that you will return I ask today oh God that the hands that were lifted and those that are standing that you would allow for us to stand for you throughout this entire year that we'll be able to witness to be able to tell of our friends and our co-workers and even our enemies that you are indeed God coming again so we ask, O oh God, that you will be with us today. For those that raise their hands today, O oh God, I ask that you will give them a double portion of blessing, that you will cover them with your blood, that you protect them from the evil one, and that you will allow for their decision today to be a lasting one. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. At this time, I'm going to ask, if you, you may be seated, I'm going to ask for those who... Who were baptized on Thursday and those who and Julie if you would join the group here all those who were baptized on Thursday and Julie who was baptized today just please join me up front no please come forward please come forward please come forward oh 
oh, Joyce is sick, so we're missing Joyce. But I'm gonna ask if those who are our board members and those who would like to just greet these individuals and welcome them into the family here at KW, if you would please join me up front and just, just greet them, show them um, the love that we do have here, give them a hug, a big tight squeeze, and let them know that they are welcome into the family. I'm gonna ask if our praise team can sing, can sing our welcome song. We're all a part of the family of God. Fountain, cleansed by its blood, join tears with Jesus as we travel along. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family. And rejoice with his victory, with the family so dear. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by his blood, joined tears with Jesus. As we travel along, I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. At KW, we always believe in giving gifts. And uh, just to congratulate you all, uh, I know that there are those who have special gifts they would like to present to you at this time. Darren? On behalf of the Kitchener Waterloo Seventh day Adventist Church, we want to congratulate you on your decision to follow the Lord. We continue to pray for you, all of you, and that the Lord will keep you, and that you will stay steadfast in Him, continue to have your special personal time with Him, because that's what grows you. Congratulations, and may God continue to bless you. Yeah. Tasha. Uh, may God bless you in your journey that you just started with him, and um, may he be your best friend. Amen. Okay. Julie, you made it, and now your journey is just beginning. And I know you'll make it, like all of us here. Congratulations. And to you. And to you. I know they're going to be standing here. Can we all stand together as we sing our closing hymn today? Yes, let's go. 